yeah. and to just read it. And I went, wait a second, like, where is my bishop? Why don't I have one anymore? And and how can somebody so early on say you need to like, you know need to cleave to your bishop and that's where you'll find the church? I kind of went, what the? <laughs> this is a family podcast, but you know, I, really, I, I I was I was awestruck to read that, and then my the logic becomes, well, where did my bishop go? Why did that? Why did that system stop being that system? Mm-hmm. You know, you you became Anglican to solve that kind of problem, but then realized that that's yeah. not really, really tenable. Mm-hmm. I mean, th- that that's important, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. If this thing existed in the early church, the, this, this system that we can see, it looks like Christ and the apostles established from a very early time frame. Never mind other things like the Eucharist and the Mass and, and baptism it's, and these things. You know, this is pretty central where did it go and, and why did it go away? Well, yeah. that was one of the great, that's one of the great shockers when somebody goes to the Church Fathers, actually, is to see, so when you're in Protestantism, they'll talk a lot about the spiritual church, right? You don't really know who's really in the church. You don't yeah. know what the yeah. church is. The, 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 the fleshliness and the tangibleness of the church, according to the Church Fathers, is a shock to you. Yeah. And it is... It is quite unique for the history of any religion to be that structured that early and to be that in communication with one another that early. Yeah. I mean, Christianity started a whole new genre of letter writing and martyrologies, and all of this is being shared across the empire, right? Mm-hmm. No other religion is doing that in the ancient world. It is only Christianity. It's unique to Christianity. Mm-hmm. So the tangibleness, the connectiveness of the early church is a shocker if you're first mm-hmm. coming to it. Yeah, and I think that that the 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 question of the bishop also ties to the cult, like the cult of the church. I I always come back to the cult. It's something that like it preoccupies my thinking completely, and I'll just confess that. Even maybe even to a fault, I have I probably have people out there who are Protestants who listen to us who just can't stand me because I keep bringing it up. <laughs> but um, Jesus is the high priest of a cult that he established with his apostles who then delivered that cult to the early Christians who then perpetuated it and built upon it as St. Paul said that they would, right? Protestant Christianity, one of the great signifiers that they implemented a new cult, a 16th century cult is removing bishops. Because for the early church, it's you. Yes, exactly. Like Cyprian calls him the high priest. You know, um, you remove the priests. So why did Christianity have priests all this time? But all of a sudden in the 16th century, you realize that, oh, wait, presbyter means old man. (laughs) You know, um, taking, you know, that's the worst etymology in the world, by the way. I mean, taking taking a word at its literal sense instead of uh, the meaning that people are ascribing to it when they use it. but yeah, it's it, you. You supplanted Jesus's cult. Putting it in those terms is is terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, you, because because it has ram, ramifications for culture. Yes, and 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 you look back when did, when did Christendom break down? Well, it started breaking down with the Reformation, yeah, yeah. because yeah. you broke the cult, you broke the priesthood, and when you the priesthood is the lifeblood of culture, and when you break the priesthood culture is going to follow after it and this is where we are post what are we now post postmodern or i don't know i don't know where we are we're in no man's land man but but that's why we're in no man's land because the priests were taken away yeah 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 it's the slippery slope of like once you take away the priesthood um you actually what you do is you um you threaten um the identity of what it means to be a man what it means to be a woman um because then the question is like, well, why can't females be priests? Like if priests are basically just like glorified, like rabbis, like just teachers, well, women can teach. Why not? Right? Like, <laughs> so that's why we have this controversy. Right. And so then, then you're on the slippery slope of, um, well, why can't a woman be a husband and a, a man be a, a wife? Why can't, you know, a man be a woman, a woman be a man. It, it all, I really would argue that we are at the very bottom. I would say we're even in the Valley um, that started all the way up at the top of the slope at the Protestant Reformation. That this is just where it leads because you you dared to exalt yourself over the Mel- the Mel- Melchizedekian high priest himself. That this this is his cult, and these are his priests, and you have no right to change the cult in such a dramatic fashion because it's not ours, right? So yeah, I, I think 
I think that's one thing that I keep coming back to with Protestantism even today is just saying like they, they keep saying that we have the tradition of men and yet I can't think of a single man to point to that is the originator of our tradition except the apostles and Christ themselves and Christ himself. But their traditions I can point to where they come from. It's the 16th century. I know that's kind of like one of those like, you know, back pocket, like basic arguments, but sometimes those basic arguments, if you, you know, they're throwaway at first, but if you really just take, you know, take them back out of the trash can and really put them for their face and say, no, but think about that. You're calling this a tradition of men, but, but I can literally put a name to your tradition. Like, isn't that a tradition of men? Like, you know, that, that's like, that's quite a change that takes place in the 16th century, a, quite a transfer of the cult. Right. So yeah, that's, that's kind of where, uh, where I'm currently at. And that's, I think what, what the getting rid of the Episcopate also signifies. Yeah. And I can recall reading St. Francis of DeSales, right, right, writing in the counter-reformation to the reformers saying, well, who gave you the authority to hang your shingle there and start that new church there? Like, where does that authority come from? <laughs> and that hit me like a ton of bricks. Like, well, of nice. course, because, right. Cause, cause all down through the ages, since the beginning of the apostles, right. Of course there was the Orthodox schism and there have been different schisms, smaller schisms mm -hmm. along the way. Right. But there was always some claim to authority like, Oh, well this, this Bishop here, or this, this is my, my succession, but suddenly the reformers just break out kind of on their own, really in, in full knowledge that, yeah, we're doing, we're doing a new thing here. Like Luther was, was breaking from that tradition mm -hmm. and the response is, well, who gave you that authority? Like, are we, are we really going to, and, right? And then you, you, you're, you're right, Stephen, is this kind of back pocket kind of, but then look, if you're a Protestant, you have to ask that question and then trace your lineage. Like, are you really so sure that Luther was right to break from this, right? Like St. Francis of the Sale, that's got a good point there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, <laughs> and are you willing to stake your, your, you know, your, to, 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 to trust that Luther was okay to break from that, mm -hmm. knowing that there but was here, but, no authority to do that, right? And, and here's the other thing that, yeah, it's exactly right. And, and here's the other thing that goes along with that. And, and, and it's kind of goes back to what Steve said too, um, that why does God keep blessing this right. church. Why does God keep it? Because right. you had the counter. Reformation, yeah, but then the church has the counter Reformation and yeah. produces another dozen saints, yeah. right, out of nowhere. And then all of a sudden, Roman Catholicism is, is, is popping up all over Southeast Asia and Japan and like, and it just blossoms elsewhere. It's so, you know, it's like the question is, Luther, what did you really have to leave? Yeah. Because St. Teresa of Avila didn't have to leave. Mm -hmm. St. John of the Cross didn't have to leave. Mm -hmm. Xavier didn't have to leave. You know, and, and so these great saints grow up just out of the Reformation itself. Mm -hmm. And then the church does reform itself. And and then you see the fruit of that work. It's like yeah. God yeah, keeps blessing these Roman Catholics. Right. L Luther <laughs> Luther is the um Luther is the classic example of um the the cure is worse than the original problem. Um it's like it's like a man has a cold, you diagnose it and you're like, we got to amputate. You know, it, it, it's like he was, he was, he was, he had a lot of insights. Yeah. He, that's the, prophetic. that's the saddest, that's the tragedy of Luther yeah. is that, you know, 15, 17 to what is it? 1520 Luther is, you know, great. I mean, he's, he's making a lot of good points guys, you know, <laughs> you, know <laughs> um, yeah. you know, I mean, it's, yeah, exactly. It, except for the, you know, his, his preoccupations with justification specifically, um, but all of his, you know, saying like, what's going on in the church? I'm with him. You know, I'm listening to him. I'm like, yeah, yeah, the church was really bad. Like it was really corrupt, you know? Um, but again, it, it becomes like, well, then what's the solution to that problem? You know, um, if Luther, here's, here's what I say. If Luther came to the Catholic church today, right? Like um, where there's Catholic study Bibles in everybody's hands, there's, you know, there's not like these crude buying and selling of indulgences happening. Um, all the things that really cheesed him off. I don't think he would have left the church. I really don't. I think his theology would have been affected by the fact that this stuff isn't, it's not ticking him off. Right. Because just knowing, just knowing Luther's personality by what I read of him, I just, it just seems to me that what really threw him on the theological trajectory of going away from the church was his experience of its corruption. Yeah. It just, it really... That's why I'm saying that conversion experiences are are they're either really great or really dangerous. Um, but there is this sense of the text, the history, 
and experience, you know, and I think Luther's experience really colored his views of the texts and then yeah. it went that way. Yeah, yeah. yeah.